the Supermarine Spitfire, probably the most famous aircraft ever to fly for the Royal Air Force. She first made her name in the Battle of Britain half a century ago. The combination of speed and agility made the Spitfire the perfect fighting machine, a reputation she kept right up to the end of the Second World War. What was it like to fly this aircraft 50 years ago? The first time I flew a Spitfire was the most exhilarating moment I had in my young life. It was a pilot's aircraft. I have never met, met anyone having flown the Spitfire that didn't come down completely enraptured with it. Clear prop. Clear prop. This is the closest I will ever get to taking the controls of a Spitfire as a passenger in this rare two-seater conversion. Spitfire Golf India X-ray, clear for takeoff on way 247200. Here we go. Okay. Well, we've just been getting clearance from the tower and we're up already. It's so majestic up here, you can see the, the coastline down there at the south of Britain. And it must have been a, a great sight for the pilots coming back after uh, boys and France and Germany. Whoa, beautiful! And a little G-force there, pressure bearing down as we turn to life there. It's a little cramped in here, but because there's so much to see out of, there's so much perspex glass, you don't feel claustrophobic at all. And this was obviously very important for the pilots to see where the enemy aircraft was. And of course, it was always coming from behind, so they would have to keep doing this. But I'll tell you something, to be a pilot, to be up here, and to be fighting for your life, it must have been one of the strangest things imaginable. You can see every bolt and every dial and every screw. There's nothing added which should really be here. It's, it's really down to the basics. In fact, it's a wonder it's got a heater, really. Oh, no! Oh, no! Right. I totally lost my bearings there. I didn't know where I was. The pilots did this all the time. They were up, they were down, they were in circles, they were upside down, and they were still fighting. It's absolutely unbelievable to think they could manage it. My own Spitfire trail began two years ago when we received a letter from a viewer, Jake Wilson, asking if we knew there'd been a Spitfire named Blue Peter. Hello, Blue Peter. We decided to track down her story, but tracing the history of a warplane that flew 50 years ago, one of over 20,000 Spitfires made, takes a lot of detective work. And it was actually called Blue Peter. After several months of following every possible lead, a few lucky breaks, and lots of help from enthusiasts, we can now tell the story of Spitfire Mark 5B. Registration 8540 called Blue Peter. In the early years of the Second World War, there was a terrible shortage of vital Spitfires. The government hit on the idea of getting the public to raise money to build them by setting up their own Spitfire funds. To spur them on, they could choose a special name for their aircraft. Support the District Spitfire Fighter Fund. Do it now. 
All over the country, funds sprang up to raise the £5,000 asked for each aircraft. One was started here by the stable boys at Newmarket Racecourse. One of the first fundraising events was a comedy football match. They're off, and to a good start, only one got away badly. Because they worked in horse racing, the fundraisers wanted their Spitfire to be named after a famous thoroughbred. They chose the winner of the 1939 derby, Blue Peter. Nearing the finish, it's all Blue Peter and his jockey, E. Smith. The favourite is going on to win by four lengths, and 1939 is Blue Peter's derby. To find out more about the fund, we've come to the offices of the local weekly paper, the New Market Journal, to look at their old wartime copies. 31st of August, 1940. Newmarket Spitfire Fund receives a flying start. Looking through the journal, you can see how the fund had got bigger. And there's one report from Saturday, February the 1st, 1941, which says Miss H. Simpson had a jumble sale and raised £12, 5 shillings. A bit like the Blue Peter appeal. If we look on a bit further, we'll see when the appeal was closed and what the paper said then. Here it is. It's a letter from the Minister of Aircraft Production, and it says it gives me great pleasure to acknowledge the handsome gift of £5,000. And he goes on to say, I promise to you that in due course, a Spitfire named Blue Peter will go into service to commemorate this gift. Blue Peter was built at the giant wartime aircraft factory at Castle Bromwich in October 1941. To check it was ready for service, every aircraft had test flights. This film from the time shows the chief test pilot, Alex Henshaw, with his dog, Tony. Here's Henshaw performing his pinpoint Spitfire aerobatics. I went to meet this famous pilot to see if he could help in the search for Blue Peter. Each aircraft was tested to uh, uh, a specification that uh, ensure that it met the design and stress requirements of the technical office. Do you know roughly how many Spitfires you must have flown? I'm told that I flew 10% of the total number of Spitfires produced, so I must have flown over 3,000 Spitfires in all. You don't happen to recall one called Blue Peter, uh, number AD540, do you? No, when you wrote to me, I, I, I looked in my logbook and I saw that it's 1941, October, Spitfire, 21st, AD, 540. I see that it flew for 40 minutes. Well, this was a normal test flight. There was nothing wrong with the aircraft. And uh, the fact that I flew it was pure chance. Just after Alex Henshaw test flew Blue Peter, an official photograph was taken. And here it is in the local paper. It's the only complete photograph we've been able to find. She's standing on the runway just before going into service. Now, we don't know who the pilot is, but this small light patch here is actually the writing of the name Blue Peter on the cowling. You might have difficulty seeing that, but at the back of the plane, near the tail, you can clearly see the plane's code number. From the few details we had, it was becoming possible to piece together the story of Blue Peter using the RAF information held at the Public Records Office. But dry documents can only hint at the stories behind a wartime squadron. I wanted to find someone who had actually flown Blue Peter in service. We struck gold with 242 Squadron. One of the flight commanders was Douglas Benham. All pilots um, felt that they were immune um, from destruction. Uh, they almost thought they were immortal. Well, in my case, I consider that bullets would bounce off me. Um, in retrospect, that seems very, very stupid indeed. A 242 Squadron um, was reformed at, at Turnhouse in uh, Edinburgh in Scotland in April 1942. And the pilots came from a variety of different places, and so did the, uh, all the Spitfire aircraft. And one of those aircraft was a Blue Peter. We gave it the code name of Alpha Robert. And this is my pilot's flying logbook, and this records all the flights that I did at that time. And when I open the page on May the 2nd and 3rd, 1942, I flew 
are for Robert Lupita. To begin with, the aircraft were shared amongst several pilots, but gradually each grew to have their favorite. Blue Peter became the personal machine of pilot officer David Hunter Blair. I see from my photograph album that I have a photograph of David Hunter Blair in Blue Peter, and on the back, I see that I've written pilot officer David Hunter Blair about to take off in Arthur Robert, which was Blue Peter. David Hunter Blair was a Scotsman. He was born in Ayrshire and grew up in a magnificent castle, Blair One. The Hunter Blairs still live here. The families lived in Ayrshire for centuries. Blair One Castle was built for them 170 years ago. David was one of three Hunter Blair brothers. It must have been something to grow up in a house like this in the 1920s. There was a full complement of servants, and the long history of the Hunter Blairs can still be read from the family portraits hanging on the walls. David led an outdoor life on the estate. He was a popular member of the family and loved sport, particularly fishing for salmon in the River Girvan that runs all the way through Blair Wan. David Hunter Blair had a younger brother, James, sitting on the right of this picture next to David. Today, James runs the estate and remembers their childhood together at Blair One. Dave would be very much a, a leader and there'd be various practical jokes and things we'd play on the other neighboring houses and other families and so on. He would be right in the forefront of this sort of thing. We went to my private school and which was, for some reason, 400 miles away in Surrey when I was about eight or seven. And he said, never mind what we're called at home. You, here, well, you call me major and I call you minor. And then he added, you could call me bro, if you like, as a sort of sop. Later, the boys went on to Eton College, the famous public school. In David's day, top hats were worn. That's changed now, although the uniform is still pretty unusual. School was divided between lower boys and upper boys. He was always uh, an upper, and um, he was always kind and nice to me. But perhaps we were never terribly close. But I always admired him a lot. He was a lot of things I wasn't. Like very good at games, and very unshy. At that time, I was self-conscious, and he wasn't. I don't think. Found life fun and easy. This was David's house at Eton, known at the time by the name of the house master, C. R. N. Routh. During David's days at the college, five years, this building was to become his second home. Traditionally, the school has links with the army, but David decided with a group of friends to leave school as soon as possible after the outbreak of war and join the RAF. The new recruits were sent to a flying training school. A fellow trainee was David Green. David Hunter Blair was a very good friend of mine. We got to know each other very well during the course. Um, it was a quiet sort of a friendship. We just enjoyed each other's company. And in fact, even at this rather young age, when you don't expect to meet gentlemen, David was a gentleman. Secretly, the young pilots went to train in the safer skies of the United States, well away from enemy aircraft. After crossing the Atlantic, they made the long journey by train to Oklahoma, home of the Spartan School of Aeronautics. We discovered one of the instructors was a keen amateur filmmaker. In 1941, he shot this remarkable colour film of the actual course that David Green and David Hunter Blair attended. Here's David Hunter Blair at the front of his section. Now that's my lot, and I'm in there somewhere. We were people, I think, who even at that age, were looking forward very expectantly to getting the best out of life. Uh, we were thoroughly enjoying what we were doing. We loved the travel, we loved the flying, and of course we did in fact come from all sorts of backgrounds, uh, from schools in the east end of London right the way through grammar schools up to Eton. We all uh, loaded up in the school buses and went to Miami Municipal Pool, which had been set aside for us that afternoon. 
Here we are walking down the path. David Hunter Blair is on the left of the picture. I am on the right, noticeable because I, for some reason or other, am wearing an RAF tie. So I remember that day clearly. It was a lovely afternoon. We enjoyed it very much indeed. Uh, there's David. There he is. That's him. There he is. That's my boy. <laughs> no teeth. After four months in Oklahoma, the pilots earned their wings as solo flyers. Now they had to return to Europe and RAF operations. So that was us going back to England. Um, we had a lovely time and it had been absolutely marvellous. But of course we were looking forward to doing the job we got trained to do. But we couldn't wait to get on the squadrons. Their first task, though, was to move on from flying steady training aircraft to the very fast Spitfire. My first flight in a Spitfire happened uh, in midwinter. Of course, once the engine was started and once I was on, on the field and actually taking off and she was bounding away like a homesick angel, um, I knew it was going to be good. And uh, I was overcome, lost for words. Uh, after I got down on the ground again, I was very anxious to log this flight, of course, uh, and I did so immediately. And on the right-hand side of the logbook, one is permitted to make the odd comment about the trip. And I could only think of one word to put down. I just put down, blimey. Newly trained, David Hunter Blair could now join an operational unit, 242 Squadron, where he teamed up with AD540 Blue Peter. On May the 19th, 1942, part of 242 Squadron, including Blue Peter and David Hunter Blair, were sent here to RAF Air. Today is just ordinary farmland and an industrial estate. It's hard to imagine that 50 years ago, it was a busy airfield, reverberating to the roar of the Spitfire's Merlin engines. 242 Squadron had been sent on a special mission. The huge ocean liner, the Queen Mary, was bringing thousands of American soldiers to Glasgow. The pilots were ordered to protect her from enemy aircraft. On the 23rd, a similar instruction was given to uh, Pilot Officer David Hunter Blair to fly Blue Peter, covering the Queen Mary as she was now approaching the docks. Some things never change. The weather and air that day, like today, was atrocious. Driving rain and thick low cloud. But their mission was considered so important, they had to fly, no matter what the weather. The records tell the story of what happened at 1300 hours, one o'clock, when David Hunter Blair took off on patrol in Blue Peter. took off in the Spitfire and did a search for David Hunter Blair's Blue Peter aircraft. The weather was so appalling, I, I, I failed to find his aircraft. Nobody knows why David Hunter Blair crashed in Blue Peter. Some say he could have lost control in the terrible visibility or his oxygen failed and he passed out. What we do know is the aircraft crashed somewhere here on the bleak mountain, cares more of Cars Fern. Tragically, David Hunter Blair was killed in the crash. He's buried here in the family cemetery at Blair One, only 15 miles from where Blue Peter came down. On his tombstone reads his age when he died. Just 19 years old. I was having lunch at school and my uh, housemaster went out to the telephone and I was called out to see him and that, that, that was it. I, um, it was a, a blow. Mm. I remember the, we had a night watch at, at school who, because there was once a bad fire at school at Eton and 
she came in to see what, if I was asleep. And I pretended to be asleep because I didn't want to worry, but of course I wasn't asleep that night. Mm. We had learned so much about David Hunter Blair and his aircraft, but we hadn't discovered exactly where Blue Peter lay. All we knew from records and eyewitnesses was that she was buried somewhere on Cairns Moor of Cars Fairn. For months, members of the Dumfries and Galloway Aviation Society searched the bleak mountainside. Exactly 51 years to the day of the crash, on the 23rd of May, 1993, their search ended. This is the first time in 50 years it's been seen. And there's a whole lot of there, Jim. There's a whole lot of aircraft there. That's definitely the engine there. It's marvellous. Two weeks after the discovery, I joined a larger recovery party to help carry out a full excavation of the wreckage. When Blue Peter was buried after the crash, she was broken up so that she could be placed in a hole. As you see now, 50 years on, you can still see a mass of twisted metal. Most bits you can identify, including this here. This is the, um, the top part of the engine. The leader of the long search was Ralph Davidson. Well, we can obviously tell it's a plane, but how do we know it's the Blue Peter AD540? Well, John, this plate here identifies it. I took this home, uh, the second visit here, and we discovered on the back someone has scratched forward AD540, and the initials look like WHP, but it positively identifies it as AD540. Blue Peter. Well, after several hours of digging, they've managed to unearth quite a few bits of the aircraft. Here's part of the wing. And this is um, the air intake. And one of the most recognisable pieces of the Spitfire was, of course, the propeller. And you can still see damage which uh, must have occurred on impact. To get Blue Peter off the mountainside to start the long process of restoration needed a modern flying machine from nearby HMS Gannett. September 1993, a lone piper plays a lament at a commemoration for David Hunter Blair and Blue Peter. Remembered by this plaque on the mountainside and the roar of spitfires over Cairnsmoor of Cars Fairn once more.